Beautiful. Amen. I can't project like that, but it sure is nice to hear. Amen. This is the last in a series titled Storm on the Horizon. Hope you've enjoyed that. I've enjoyed sharing with you uh, some things that we're seeing in the world today and how to contemplate those things, how to respond to those things, and how those things motivate us to serve God and to draw close to God in our daily lives. And I hope this last message is the same help to you. Father in heaven, I pray, I invite your presence to speak to our hearts, to let us know that we have heard a word from you today through your truth, the truth of God's word. Lord, that may that truth be rooted deep in our hearts. May it be not only planted, but may it grow in nurturing our trust and our confidence in you and your provision for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Rochelle is kind of the motivation for the message today. She admits it. Um, her mind processes things much differently than mine does. Uh, she was telling me how just uh, y yesterday uh, I was off at the um, fundraising event. It was a golf tournament here for TAA yesterday morning. And um, she told me later on that day that as I was gone, she heard a knock at the door as she was upstairs, and, and, or maybe it was the doorbell that was ringing. But anyway, someone was there at the door, and she finally made her way down, and no one was there. So her mind was processing, why did someone knock or, or ring the doorbell and not stay so I could answer it? And um, in her doing that, then her mind started to go. And it started to go places she's gone before. I wonder if that was a police officer. I wonder if something has happened to John. I wonder if he was in an accident. Oh no, how am I gonna get along without him? What, what do I do next? And it just kept going until I think she probably realized, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> Um, in fact, that's probably why I got a text out there. So how's it going out there at the golf course? And I responded back, and she knew that I was fine. But this isn't just one time. And this, this is things, these are things that happen from time to time. And she's not alone, I know that. And as we've been talking about things related to the, the time in which we live, uh, some of you may be a little anxious, maybe a little concerned, a little worried about what is coming upon the world. Uh, if you look at study after study, you find, especially with our young people, um, Generation Z, even millennials, are really struggling with the changes they're seeing in the world today. It's, it's, a, it's very heavy and it's pressing hard on them because they're thinking, boy, if the world's like this now, what's it going to be like not long from now? Because things don't seem to be getting better, they're just getting worse. Well, I. I think that it's important for me to share that although the world may get worse, we serve a God, a Father in heaven who loves his children. And we need to know that no matter what we go through, he stands with us. And that's what I want to share with you today. And I'm going to do that in the context of a psalm. Psalm 46, if you'd like to Open your Bibles. You can follow right along with me. I'll have some other scriptures in there as well as I go through the psalm to kind of bring it to life a bit. But uh, Psalm 46, I'm reading in the NIV. The scripture will also be up on the screen. Um, we've been talking about some crazy things happening in the world, and I think it's time we turn our attention on what God is doing and what he invites us to do here as we see these changes happen. Uh, Psalm 46 
can be easily divided into three parts. I say easily because each section is divided by a term, selah, and, or selah, however you pronounce that. Uh, so there's some differences as to, you know, how that should be pronounced. But it is, it is essentially uh, a notation to pause. Uh, these psalms were sung. And this is a pause for contemplation. And so we see three of them in this, this chapter. And so we know that whenever it was sung, it was sung in three stanzas. Um, first one, our source of strength and trouble expressed in universal terms. Secondly, an assurance of the Lord's protection. And lastly, a call to trust in the Lord who restores peace. I'm reading from Psalm 46 again, verse 1. Follow along with me. God is our refuge and strength in every ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, we will not fear. The fact that God is our refuge and strength is a given to the psalmist. We don't know who wrote this psalm. But he's very aware that God is ever-present with us. In fact, that word ever-present help, or the series of words there, it means help that can be found just when you need it. You know, I have found in my life that God doesn't seem to send help early. I don't know if you've witnessed, kind of had this same experience in your life, but God seems to wait to when you really need it. And even sometimes when you're desperate for it. Have you ever experienced this? It's like the money for the bill doesn't come until the day before the bill's due, or even sometimes the day the bill's due. God allows us an opportunity to trust him. And he to us is an ever-present, he's always there, help in times of trouble. God is calling us to a radical trust in the face of overwhelming fear. Fear that's enticing because we see what's happening around us but fear that is unnecessary. These opening words provide assurance of God's presence with you at all times. And if God is for you, finish it with me, who can stand against you? You can go through anything when God is with you. You can. You may not think so, but you can go through anything when God is with you. Listen, Christians in the early church were not supermen and superwomen of faith. They were people, they were believers like you and me. And if you read some of the stories of what they went through, as especially in the book of Hebrews, as it recalls or recounts some of the things happening in those days, it was horrific. You know, the Colosseums, and they'd bring in Christians, and they would just let wild animals have at them, and all these things, and the peace, though, that was residing with those that were trusting. We, you'd be amazed at what you can go through in the face of incredible trouble and threats when God is with you. It's not that we have peace in and of ourselves. It's that he gives us the peace to trust him to get us through these trials. Our creator is sovereign. He's in control of the elements in this world. As it describes the 
earth giving way and the mountains falling into the heart of the sea and the water is being agitated and foaming. He is sovereign and he has control over these elements and he limits them. Many of you remember the story of Jesus in the boat with the disciples and the boat was being tossed and the disciples were panicking. And what was Jesus doing? Sleeping. How can you sleep? We're about to die, they cried. And he said, oh, come on. You have little faith. Stood up on the boat, in the boat, and just told the waves to be quiet. And they were. You see, mountains quaking, earth giving way, the waters roaring, that's nothing to God. All, I believe, metaphors for life that ebbs and flows, that challenges us along the way. Life is not easy. We shouldn't expect it to be easy. We should expect it to be hard at times. But what's wonderful about serving God and trusting him is that he is with us through it all and gives us the strength that we don't have just when we need it. The psalmist here is asking us to determine in our mind, we will not fear. It's a decision made not to fear. This is an imperative. We won't do it. And I believe this is really what faith is about. Faith isn't just belief in a higher power. Faith is the exercise of that belief to trust that God will get you through your trials in life and to claim those promises that he gave you and allow him to be that, that refuge that we need him to be. Listen, if, we, if God was to lift the veil and we could see spiritually what's going on that we can't see right now, you would be so thankful that God is with you to hold back the forces of evil, forces that we wrestle with that aren't made of flesh and blood but are supernatural and powerful and would have your life, take your life in a moment if they were allowed to. But God says, no. I won't let it go that far. We will not fear. Tell yourself, I will not fear. I will not fear. God is with me. The psalm continues in verse 4. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fail. God will help her at break of day. Now, it's kind of an interesting thing here because God is talking about the city, or the psalmist is talking about the city where God dwells. And then he says, you know, it will not fail. And then he says God will help her. What help are we talking about? What, wait a minute, the city is the fortress of God. It's in heaven. He dwells there. Why does it need help? You see, one of the things I'm seeing here is that God counts us as his people, as citizens of the kingdom already. The church here today is an extension of the kingdom of God in heaven. So when he says, the psalmist says, God will help her at the break of day, he's saying God will be present here with his people, his church, to help them when they need it. The city of God is also the sanctuary of God. The holy place where the Most High dwells is a reference to God's sanctuary. It'll say that here in the next part of the stanza. 
but this is his illusion. So there's a city, there's a temple in that city, a sanctuary. And throughout the Old Testament, you see that, that Israel refers to the temple or the sanctuary in heaven as God's house, where God lives. And we also see in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, this sanctuary in heaven, and it opens the veil, and we can see the imagery that is there on the about the sanctuary in heaven. And it is the place where Christ ministers today for us with his own blood. Now, most of us are familiar with customs in Asia where you go over to somebody's house, and as you come in, what's the first thing you do? You take off your shoes. Why do you take off your shoes? Out of respect, number one, but why do, what, what's the important part of taking off shoes? What, why would you take off your shoes even here in America? To keep the dirt out. God invites our dirt in. He says, come to me and confess your sins. Repent. I will forgive you. I will cover you by my blood. And this is going on in his house. He invites us in this close proximity to be one with him so that he can clean us up. And when it's time to help us get through the troubles to get us finally home to live with him forever. Today, not just in the future, God's people are citizens of the kingdom. You belong to your Father in heaven. You belong to your Creator. You were created by Him. He's looking out after you. And ultimately, after all the stuff that's going on in this world is done, He will deliver you and He will bring you home to live with Him forever. Psalm 91, we read a first part of that earlier in the service today. It says here just exactly how God provides that help and deliverance. Not only does he have weapons of warfare in his home that he can send out and use and we can help. You know, we're called to put on all the armor of God, right? That's armor God gives us. He's got this weaponry, this armor. But also he has a heavenly host, this unnumbered host that is at his disposal to send when we need it. So it says in Psalm 91, by, by the way, a psalm of the time of trouble. This is about the time of trouble, this, this psalm, 91. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. Because you made the Lord your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Sometimes it's hard to understand or to feel the reality of that. I think if we did, like this veil could be removed and we could see what was going on, I think in a lot of respects, some of the decisions we make would be a little different, wouldn't they be? Sometimes we make decisions, and especially the bad ones, when we're by ourselves, when we think no one's watching. But our angels are with us. We've always got somebody here to help us. And in the time of trouble, God promises, I will send them so that nothing bad happens to you. God does not take us out of the world during the time of trouble, as some suggest. He carries us through the time of trouble. We see it happening around us, as the psalm says, but it will not come near you. And this is God's promise to you. Now, there's a little bit of a division here, so we need to, I want to provide some qualifiers. Listen, 
Even in death, God is with you. Did you know that? It doesn't really matter what happens to this body. What matters is our eternal, our eternal security in heaven and in the new earth. Amen? Now, I know there's some fear about, oh, what's going to happen? You know, am I going to be captured or... You know, these things the Bible talks about, you know, like families giving up or uh, on, their, on their, their family members and they turn them in. And, you know, it, uh, even the reference by Jesus makes that people will kill you thinking they're doing God's service. There is a time of trouble that starts before probation closes, probation for mankind, and there's the great time of trouble afterward. Psalm 91, great time of trouble afterward. Listen, once everybody's decision is made, there's no reason to allow martyrs. There's no reason to let his people die because it, it's, it, would be, it would be meaningless. But it doesn't mean that some of us might not be called or, or, or won't be called to stand for what you believe in the face of incredible threats to your life and to say, though you slay me, I will still serve God. I have settled in my mind that if something like that happens, I'm okay with it. Because I know even if they take my life, the next thing I'm going to see is Jesus coming to raise me back up again. So even in death, there really is no fear when God is with you, right? And he can give you the strength to go through anything especially when you're standing up for his honor and his glory. So don't fear that either. In verse 6, back to Psalm 46, it says, Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. Words repeated again here shortly, later in the psalm. You know, I just find it assuring that God's kingdom is so far, so much higher than any kingdom of this world, nothing really can stand against him. Anybody else take comfort in that? I mean, if God is there with us and his kingdom is so much higher than any other kingdom, it just, it doesn't matter the kingdoms of this world aren't worth fighting for. That's why I struggle to a degree with a lot of the political maneuverings and the things going on in this world because it's telling me the world is coming to a close and that these things aren't worth fighting for. Our mission as a church is to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out there, which is... In essence, the Lord God Almighty, Almighty is with us, God with us. Jesus, the God of Jacob, is our fortress. Amen? When sin's corruption finally reeks, reaches its peak and Jesus returns, he does so with the voice of an archangel. We know that from 1 Thessalonians. And the elements, it says, will... Melt with fervent heat, 2 Peter 3, all alluding to this passage, I believe. So what can we say about our troubles today? Rochelle and I remind ourselves sometimes when we see thing, people going through terrible things, we look at ourselves and we say, boy, our troubles are just nothing to be talked about, to complain about. Any complainers out there? Don't like the way something's going in life or, oh, this isn't good, I'm not doing this. I, I, no one seems to pay me more money, I can't find a job with more money or, or gosh, I'm, I'm just sick too much, I just I gotta go to the doctor again. I mean, th these things, they're, they're, they're difficult, but open your eyes to the world and what's going on today. Wars and conflicts are increasing rapidly. 
And in the face of these things, though, we know that God is faithful to us. We will soon enter the heavenly Canaan. And we have the same promise that Moses gave to Joshua and Israel, and Israel, as they were about to enter the promised land back in the book of Deuteronomy. It says there in Deuteronomy 31, verse 8, and the Lord, this is now the promise Moses is giving to Joshua and the people. The Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. We need to trust that these promises are true and they belong to us. God will not leave us or ever forsake us. In Psalm 46, verse 8, we begin the last section of this psalm. The psalmist says, Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow, uh, the bow, and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Again, more metaphor, more imagery of his defense of his people. Look and see what the Lord has done. Look and see how faithful God is in the face of trials and struggles. Anything that God does, the desolation he creates is for one purpose, is to stay the tide of evil. A lot of people struggle with God and some of the work that he did in the Old Testament with the rapidly rising nations around his people. And if you read a little bit about some of their practices, they were doing terrible things, horrific things within their cultures. And so God asked his people to destroy them, wipe them out. Any of these desolations that God did in the Old Testament was for the purpose of protecting his people and staying the tide of evil. My friends, evil today is growing again. As in the days of Noah, so will it be before the coming of the Son of Man, right? So we should expect that. And we do see it today. There is actually evidence. We see visible evidence, historical evidence of these things. Um, according to the website worldpopulationreview.com, there are 39 active wars in the world today. And I believe that war, just is just my, my opinion, maybe others hold it, but war seems to be kind of the definitive example of the rising evil in the world. War is horrific and terrible. But over the last 200 years, the number of wars has increased with deaths as weapons especially become more deadly and population grows. But I want you to notice on the right side of this, this chart that was created by Max Roser, he went through history and he charted conflicts. Anything that resulted in deaths that, resulted, that was a, from a clash between two groups, or two nations or clans or, or people. So you see this happening on the left side. You see these different things charted and you see a slight rise there in number of deaths with big things that were happening. The bigger bubbles that are on this show the larger, the, the larger conflict. Uh, what's the biggest bubble on the map over here on the right? World War II, okay? But I want you to notice this. Look at about 1800. I don't know if you see it very well, but in 1800, look at the increase. Do you see the increase in conflict? It's like so many more things began to develop and happen at a time that we understand the Bible tells us is called the, the end of time or the latter days. And so we expect to see something like this, and this is em empirical evidence that it, in fact, is happening. Now, while the red line in the chart there, compiled by Roser, shows the worldwide rate of war deaths per 100,000 people as going down, 
the number of war activity has gone up. And it's interesting when the increase in war activity began, as we've seen here, it correlates with the time of the end. So I share this with you, not just, not as like a fear thing. I'm just saying that today we are living just before our ascension to the heavenly kingdom when Jesus comes. Jesus will soon return. What we're seeing, what we talked about over the last few um, parts of this series is stuff that's going on in the world. And so we expect this. But God tells us, even as we see it, do not, what? Fear. I am with you. In his book, Fearless, Max Lucado referred to another book by Jim Collins titled Good and Great. In that book, Collins introduced Admiral James Stockdale, a prisoner of war for eight years during the Vietnam War. After Stockdale's release, Collins asked him how in the world he survived eight years as a prisoner of a war camp. He replied, I never lost faith in the end of the story. I never doubted not only that I would get out, but also that I would prevail in the end and turn the experience into the defining event of my life, which in retrospect, I would not trade. Collins then asked him, who didn't make it out? Admiral Stockdale replied, oh, that's easy, the optimists. They were the ones that said, we're going to be out by Christmas. And Christmas would come and Christmas would go. And they'd say, we're going to be out by Easter. And Easter would come and Easter would go. And then Thanksgiving, and then it would be Christmas again. And they died of a broken heart. Listen, while it's true that the coming time of trouble will one day become a reality, it won't last forever. It's important that we keep our mind fixed on the end of the story. And what is that ending? Jesus coming to set everything right and his people delivered from evil and sin forever. Well, what does this look like from a practical standpoint? Well, the psalmist concludes then, verse 10, the last 10 and 11, the last two verses of the psalm. He says, notice this, be still and, finish it with me, know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted in the earth the Lord Almighty is with us. Again, these words repeated. The God of Jacob is our fortress. You see, our response to the chaos around us is to be still. And what? And know that he is our God. This isn't the still quietness of a vacant mind but the patient confidence, knowing that God is with us in reality. For the Lord our God, our God is our fortress, and we are eternally secure in him. Love the way that Isaiah puts it. Isaiah verse, chapter 30, verse 15, in returning and rest you shall be saved, in quietness and confidence shall be your, what? Strength. Lucado gives us an important principle to live by today. He says, feed your fears and your faith will starve. Feed your faith and your fears will. Don't let your fears have their way with you. Determine to fear not and instead feast on the promises of God. 
You see, in these words, be still and know that I am, I am God, this is another imperative. This is a command for God's people to determine in their minds that they will trust God no matter what happens to them. You decide, I decide, whether or not I will choose fear or peace. And God responds to our choice by giving us peace that passes all understanding. Even in death, death has no, it doesn't have the final word over us. One day death will be no more. So again, what can man do to us? Nothing. That will take away our inheritance in heaven with Jesus, our Savior. As I close this message, I want to just share this passage from Psalm 27. It's one of my favorite psalms in the Bible. We do know that David wrote this one. He says in Psalm 27, verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing, how many things? One thing I have desired of the Lord that, I, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. There's that sanctuary language again. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. The one thing that David sought above all else was to dwell in God's house, his sanctuary one day. That should be our focus every day, to dwell with God. If you've looked around, there isn't much in this world holding, worth holding on to. You know, money, jobs, those things, ah, oh, that's just to sustain our life. Our mission, our goal today is to share the love of Christ with others so that they might know the, the Savior, the, the, their refuge and their fortress in the time of trouble. Heard a song on the way down coming here this morning, and it just struck me. Just something small, little line. Seek the face of God before the hand of God. In other words, seek the face of God, his presence. As, as Pam said earlier, the relationship we have with God. Seek that first before the hand of God giving you what you need. Because the hand of God always comes after the face experience with God. So I want to encourage you to, to spend time with Jesus. Spend time with your Father in heaven. Invite the Holy Spirit to fill you and to guide you every day of your life because that is the only way that we will not only meet our Savior today, but that he can become our source of peace and security in these troubling times. The sanctuary in heaven, it says, is our haven of peace. It's the place where he hides his people from the corruption and devastation of the world around them. Not physically, we're still here on this earth, but spiritually. Listen, your mind strengthened with the power of God. It's what drives your peace today. We saw earlier that picture of the guy standing right in front of the tidal wave. Did you see that one? He wasn't moved. It's a great picture of how we don't have to be moved by the circumstances we see around us. We can trust in God who is able to get us through any trouble that comes our way. And when you're high upon the rock, which he says he will place you, you're above the chaos below. 
The world may be falling apart around you, but Jesus will set you high above the evil and the corruption everywhere to give you rest in his abiding presence. I want to encourage you today. I want to ask you today to recommit your life to God, to your Father in heaven, to trust him to be your refuge, to trust him to be your fortress. Don't look at the circumstances. Don't let yourself get overwhelmed by the troubles in life. They will come, and if, let me say, if you're having trouble, it's not going to last forever. If you don't have trouble, it's coming. Right? So when trouble comes, give it to God. He's your fortress. He's your refuge. He will get you through. This is the promise when we see that storm coming on the horizon. It's coming at us quickly. But God is on our side. Father in heaven, Lord, we, we praise you today for making a way for us through Jesus, our Savior. And then Jesus says that we should trust you, our Father, to provide for our needs and to see us through trouble. And then Jesus left us with your Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to fill us and to strengthen us, to get us through every day of life. Lord, we have everything we need I pray that you would help us to lift our eyes and look up before we spend much time with how much we care about the things that aren't going well below. So, Father, please, with everyone here within my hearing, if they in this moment invite you into their heart again, if they invite you right now to recommit their lives and themselves to you and your cause, the cause of the gospel. And they want to live the way you've asked us to live in your word. Lord, I pray that you will respond to that, that you'd fill them with your spirit, that you give them the strength to stand strong, and that you would invite them into your pavilion, your temple that dwells in the city of God so that we can know without a, day, uh, without a doubt that we are safe in your arms. Father, we thank you. We love you. And we praise you in advance for what you will do whenever trouble comes. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.